About a third of healthcare in the U.S. is wasteful. 30% of $5 trillion, that is a huge amount of money. Welcome to Radio Davos, the podcast from the World Economic Forum that looks at the biggest challenges and how we might solve them. This week, as populations get older, the cost of healthcare increases. How can health systems around the world cope? Part of the answer might be something called value-based healthcare. Higher patient satisfaction, better outcomes, and less cost of care. That's the promise of value-based healthcare, but what is it? What would it look like for us patients and for healthcare providers? We hear from a doctor at a hospital in New York and from someone who's been advocating for value-based healthcare for years, who explains why a seemingly obvious shift to concentrate on complete patient outcomes rather than individual medical procedures is proving so hard to implement. Such a big change often requires some type of crisis or some type of huge innovation. In the case of healthcare, I actually believe that we are approaching this tipping point because we have a bit of both. Subscribe to Radio Davos wherever you get your podcasts or visit wef.ch slash podcasts where you'll also find our sister podcast, Meet the Leader and Agenda Dialogues. I'm Robin Pomeroy at the World Economic Forum and with this look at value-based healthcare. It makes the conversation better and it creates true patient empowerment. This is Radio Davos. Healthcare. We all need it, and it's one of the most expensive things in pretty much any country, requiring vast investments, no matter what kind of system is in place. And as populations age, the health bill is just going to increase. So, what if there was a way to save money on healthcare while at the same time improving outcomes? for patients. That's the promise of something called value-based healthcare, a notion that's been around for a couple of decades where patient outcomes are monitored and healthcare services are funded on the basis of quality care rather than the quantity of procedures. To explore the idea of shifting from volume-based to value-based healthcare, the World Economic Forum has brought together public and private sector players in the Global Coalition for Value in Healthcare, and it's now launching the Digital Healthcare Transformation Initiative, which aims to improve outcomes through more efficient and effective mechanisms. Later on this episode, we speak to a doctor in New York City who's working on this. She's a chief value medical officer. But first, I spoke to Meni Stiliadu. She's the founder and co-lead of the Health Outcomes Observatory and vice president, Health Data Partnerships, Data Science Institute at the pharmaceuticals company Takeda. Meni has been advocating for value-based healthcare for years since she first heard of the idea, which struck her as a no-brainer. I started by asking Meni Stiliadu, how, in one sentence, she would define value-based healthcare? Is let's get healthcare to focus on results and not on activities. It's as simple as that, really. This is a system of healthcare that would try to get the best results and focus less on each individual prescription or operation. How kind of widespread is it? Does it exist already, value-based healthcare? And... What does it look like in real life? You know, what, could you give us a before and after? Here's what a patient would experience not in value-based healthcare, which is probably what most health systems are. And this is what a patient would experience with the same diagnosis under value-based healthcare. I think the fundamental difference in what a patient would experience is that if we were to live in a world of value-based healthcare, a patient would never have to ask themselves questions as to, was that needed? Was this doctor really interested in giving me the best possible care? Or did he do it or did she do it because they just wanted yet another treatment, yet more some revenue? For some countries, the countries where the healthcare professionals are paid currently on the basis of the services they provide, the fee-for-service model, as we call it, which is very prevalent in lots of big part of the world, in the US and several European countries as well. Now, there's these other countries, the countries where they follow the, the NHS model of the UK, where the doctors are not being paid because of the service they provide, but they have a fixed salary, more or less. But then the patient may not worry are they doing this because they are going to go get more money out of me? But in that case, the patients worry, will they have any time for me? 
because they have no incentives to see me at all. They have a fixed salary and that's it. So in an outcome-based world, the patient would feel more like we feel in other parts of the society as a client, as a customer. But as a customer who knows that the service provider's incentives are aligned to the patient's incentives. So that's in a nutshell, that's what this is about. An alignment of incentives between healthcare providers, healthcare systems, and patients' needs. Under that scenario, the patient is more confident that they are getting the treatment that they they actually need. Would it be a noticeably different experience, though, apart from just that confidence? Yes. On a large scale, OECD tells us that currently we spend 20% of our healthcare cost for not needed interventions. That's huge. So that's the cost element. But then I think there is the element of the cost on the individual, because it's not just the cost of the healthcare system or of what this, the society pays. It's also that get submitted to unnecessary interventions. You have difficulties to get access to the interventions you need, or you have difficulties to get access to the doctors you need. So your overall outcomes in healthcare are not optimal, are not what they should be. Can you give us an idea of kind of how widespread this is at the moment. I, you know, I, if you Google value-based healthcare, you are told it is a term coined in 2006 by Harvard professor Michael Porter. So the idea has been around for, you know, getting on for two decades. Has it actually been put in practice in places? It's very small pockets. I'm an antitrust lawyer in telecom, so I moved to healthcare more or less in 2006, more or less the same time that Michael Porter was writing his book. And back then I joined Novartis and I was responsible for European public affairs based in Brussels. I read the book in 2008 and now having come from the technology sector, I was very surprised with the inefficiencies I found in healthcare with this misalignment of incentives. And having read the book, I said, that's it. It's so clear what needs to happen. So... I decided, let's organize a conference in Brussels. Let's invite the commission and the ministers. I had the possibility to do that, and I did it. I could not pay for Michael Porter. He was too expensive. But I could afford Elizabeth Teisberg, who is the co-author of the book. So Elizabeth came to Brussels. We had the conference. The commissioner were there. There were a couple of ministers, captains of the industry, 200 people in the audience. And I felt job done. Now it was going to take three, five, to five years maximum for this to really resonate with everybody. You felt it was job done because it, it, it was obvious. It seems so obvious. It's so obvious. Kind of, it's win win all round, and there will be efficiencies, and everyone's experience is going to improve. Sorry, I interrupted you. Why was it not job done then in the next couple of years? That's a really good question, and I spent the rest of the last the last fifteen years trying to figure it out. And the reality is a big change. It's a huge change of the system. And it is a really big change of the way hospitals operate, of the way of the way healthcare professionals are being rewarded to a certain extent. So it is a massive change. And these very big changes tend to happen only when governments decide to do it and they enter into the space very seriously. And governments decide to do these big changes, whether there is a big opportunity or a big threat of some sort. And in that case, we may actually reaching that tipping point because we are, as a society, we start seeing that we are aging, the healthcare expenditure continues rising. And as a society, we can't quite afford the same type of healthcare, but it needs a crisis because such a big change often requires some type of crisis or some type of huge innovation. In the case of healthcare, I actually believe that we are approaching this tipping point because we have a bit of both. So on one hand, we have the crisis. The crisis is emerging everywhere. On the other hand, we also have 
the technology innovation will come through digital technologies. So a lot of the things that we couldn't do earlier, now we can do them. Now we can actually monitor, for example, the results or the way we call them in our language, the outcomes, the patient outcomes through digital means. It makes the solution easier and at the same time, the problem becomes bigger. And that's why I think we're kind of reaching that tipping point. So let's talk about measuring patient outcomes then, which, as you say, is vital to this. If you're not just counting the number of procedures or the the amount of medicines being prescribed, you're measuring the outcome and the experience of the patient. As I told you my story after that meeting and having realized that value-based healthcare is not happening anytime soon, I started thinking, okay, how can we accelerate this movement in a practical way? One way is to talk to governments, but that is not always working. So how are we going to do it in a different way? And my thinking was there is one stakeholder who will benefit hugely from that, and these are the patients. Because if you think about this huge transformation we are talking about, the healthcare providers, I think they would benefit as well, but not immediately. There is also this 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 change that needs to happen. The patients, however, they have no say in all this. We are very, very passive in the healthcare system. So the idea was, what if we use these digital technologies to give patients the tools to start measuring their outcomes, but in a way that will be listened to? And it will only be listened to if it's standardized. So you writing, I'm very tired, is interesting, but doesn't mean anything to a scientist. But if you say that I have a level of fatigue that doesn't allow me to do my daily shopping or doesn't allow me to get out of my house, and this is how fatigue is being measured in a certain in a certain way, then it means something to, to a scientist. So the idea was, okay, what if we were to give to the patients these digital tools so they start measuring these outcomes in a standardized way and this creates a language, a common language between patients and physicians, but at the same time, it creates transparency of outcomes and it gives to the patients the possibility to actually measure what is what they can report, the patient-reported outcomes. But this also gives them the possibility to see when it works, when it doesn't, where it works better and where it works least well. Now, the data are being aggregated in independent entities, which we call the observatories. And the mission of the observatories is to observe health, so to observe the outcomes. It's not about creating a blame. So it's not something like a trip advisor for health that you see that the outcomes are better in this hospital or in other but it creates the transparency of the outcomes and it makes it it creates the incentives in people to actually start comparing and see what works and what doesn't and what they can do better and what they can do less well and that is that done kind of on a patient by patient basis or hospital by hospital regional countrywide yes so to make this work you need to work with the physicians. You need to work with, with, with the doctors because I have to say that they are very frustrated themselves with the way the healthcare system is being delivered. Now, not all are equally uh, incentivized or equally inspired by this, but there are a lot of physicians who actually really want to work with a standardized way for measuring patient outcomes and really finding ways to improve patient outcomes. These millions of people have become doctors because they want to improve patient outcomes. Life sometimes could make them cynical, like it does with all of us, but their intentions are the right ones. So we've started this in a consortium with a number of top clinical hospital, academic hospitals across Europe. And and we are now, it's three years now that we started the project. And actually, it's, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that we are now starting implementing this prompt. So these hospitals are now starting utilizing these patient reported outcomes in their communications with the patients. So these are in Germany, Austria, 
Netherlands and Spain. These are some of, as I said, top academic hospitals there, but it starts. I hear now that there's more and more interest, for example, in Germany with other hospitals to also join, to engage in this patient-centered way of communicating. And do you think it is applicable across different regions of the world? As you say, there are very different systems. Of course, there's lots of countries with much less well-funded health systems. Is it universally applicable? Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, if we make this a language, (laughs) which is our intention, it's what we're aiming at, it is a language that all patients want to speak. Because there is this awkward moment when you go to see a doctor and they ask you, how have you been? And maybe you remember how you've been last week, but it is unlikely that you remember how you've been the last six months or the last year. So the possibility of actually measuring your outcomes in a standardized way and being able to go there with a dashboard which shows how you've been and also tell them what is that bothers you most and where you would like the emphasis to be in your treatment, it makes the conversation better and it creates true patient empowerment. In, in some of these places, is this an app on a phone where people are filling it in every day? Yes. Sometimes every day. It doesn't need to be every day, depending on the disease, depending on the condition. And this is also an area of research, right? Because as I said, we are creating languages here. So there have been usage of PRO, so patient reported outcomes in clinical trials. So in the development of drugs for many years now, that's not a new thing. What is The development is that we say we are now using versions of that in the clinical setting as a communication between the patient and the doctor. And that's not quite the same because in a clinical trial, it's a trial, which means that there is a nurse, there is a certain continuity in how you measure things because you are measuring a drug, you're measuring how efficacious or not a drug can be. In the clinical setting, the conversation is how can you doctor, physician, nurse, and patient communicating better so that you focus the energy on patient's outcomes. So it's a similar mechanism, but it's not the same. And in developing this language, because that is what it is, it's really important to be pragmatic. It's, it shouldn't be, it's not a research project. It's not the idea, it's, it's, it doesn't need to be very precise. The important thing is that it improves the communication. And that means that sometimes the patient feels like doing it once a week. Sometimes they feel they want to do it once per day. The system has to accommodate for that because the important thing is to satisfy the patient's need and help the patient articulate towards the healthcare, the doctor, but also the healthcare system more generally what it is that they need most and do this in an evidence-based way. So it's kind of in a trial phase, would you describe it in, in across those three or four countries? What needs to happen then to scale this up? Uh, right now, I have to say my own brain is focusing on delivering in the countries where we are established. I actually think there's not that many barriers to bring this to other countries because Already, the results of our work, which is what we call the pragmatic sets, can be used more broadly. They are publicly available. Other hospitals can use them as well. So I don't think the barriers are that big. It's important to remember that one benefits from technology here. So leveraging digital solutions here is really, really important. And probably we're at its infancy. Because it's not about answering a questionnaire, right? There are a lot of technology solutions that, if appropriately adjusted, can really help creating this patient-generated data that can help the conversation. So, for example, your movement, right? It's not You don't need to answer a questionnaire or your sleep, the quality of your sleep. There are passive ways of capturing this information. Right. A lot of people capture their own data. Yes, uh, all kinds of health data, certainly sleep, yes, the, but the, the, the performance of your heart, all this kind of stuff. Exactly. That, these, these are quite common things that people choose to do for their own monitoring already. But frequently when you bring this to your doctor, they say it's noise. I don't know what that means. 
So what needs to happen is that they need to be translated into a language, which also means something for the doctor. And that's the work that we're currently doing. Tell us something then finally about the work of the World Economic Forum. There's this thing called the Global Coalition for Value in Healthcare. This is a forum that was created, I think, three or maybe more years ago with the idea of making the world more aware of how value-based healthcare can really transform healthcare. And it has done some great work in uh, creating a community of enthusiasts who learn from each other and encourage each other in driving this forward. I think right now we are at the point where we really need to focus more on how technologies can help because, as I said earlier, they offer yet another tool to actually make value-based healthcare happen, to resolve some of the problems the value-based healthcare had at its beginning. When, when will I be getting value-based healthcare, do you think, um, or, or anyone who might be listening to this? I think you will start receiving value-based healthcare when you will start being able to monitor your own results on your own. Because then your voice will matter. Then you will be able to see or to compare your real outcomes to the outcomes of other patients. And as a result, you will become an agent of change yourself because you will start asking the right questions. I'll share with you another little story, which is about Sweden and Switzerland. So in OECD did a study on breast cancer several years ago, and they found out that the outcomes in Sweden were some of the best in the world, maybe not the top, but the second top, anyway. And the outcomes in Switzerland were somewhere like eighth or ninth. However, the patients in Switzerland thought they had the best possible healthcare in the world, and the patients in Sweden thought that their healthcare was declining. You know why? It all had to do with how patients were treated. So in a place like Sweden, patients are treated with a number. It's a socialized, it's an NHS type of environment. So they get excellent care, but it's very much like, you know, you're, you have a number, you go there, you do that. There's no much of personal attention. Switzerland has a different healthcare system and some of the most, I, I think, in my opinion, luxurious hospitals I've ever seen. So patients had an excellent patient experience. So that's really important for patients, but what's even more important is survival after breast count, right? But this is something that as a patient, you can't judge. You need the data in order to be able to judge. So the moment we start having this data, and that's why I say the moment you will start having a dashboard with what's your outcomes and possibilities to compare with the outcomes of the average patient or a similar patient, then regardless of what the government has done, you will be able to say, why are my outcomes not as good? And what can we do about that? And what can we do about the other? So you will trigger the transformation to value-based healthcare on your own, even without the government doing anything about it. They will eventually, because they will have to listen to you. But that's why I'm saying that's going to be the signal we are going towards value-based healthcare. Meni Stiliadu is the founder and co-lead of the Health Outcomes Observatory and Vice President Health Data Partnerships at the Data Science Institute at Takeda. To New York now and to Dr. Catherine McLean, who works at the Hospital for Special Surgery, a hospital that specialises in orthopaedic surgery. As Chief Value Medical Officer there, Catherine is spearheading ways of putting value-based healthcare into practice. I started by asking her how she explains to the average person what value-based healthcare is. Consumers, you know, the average person in the population makes value-based decisions every single day. When you go to put gasoline or petrol in your car, when you buy something at the grocery store, you're, you're making these value-based decisions. And we should be doing the same thing in healthcare. I think it's more difficult from a consumer standpoint because number one, it's hard to understand the quality. I think we're getting better at being more transparent about the quality of 
one provider, one hospital versus another, one doctor versus another, for example. And then the cost. In the U.S., there's now legislation that says, you know, we should be transparent about the cost. We're, we're getting there, but we're not there. But I think the other complicating piece in healthcare is contrast to when you buy a product, you buy a car, right? You take that item home with you. But healthcare, you're really buying health. I would say value-based healthcare is focused on improving health. It's focused on the long term. And if you take a procedure, for example, you could go to one hospital. So we do orthopedic surgery. We'll take the example of a hip or a knee replacement. You could go to one hospital and it may cost, you know, some amount of money. You can go to another hospital and, it'll, you know, let's say it costs more money, maybe 20% more, you know, at a different hospital. But you can't just think about the cost of the procedure. You need to be thinking about the cost of the episode. So maybe that hospital that's a little bit more expensive, maybe their readmission rate is very, very low, right? And so when you think about having a procedure, you need to think about the cost of care from the time the patient has the procedure to some reasonable time point, you know, in the future. I would say for many surgeries, you know, that's probably counted in the 30, 60, 90 day window for a complex surgery. You might want to think about it a year out. And in fact, we've done studies looking at some of the very complex procedures that we do and have demonstrated, you know, a $40,000 difference in that one year episode cost. And along with that $40,000 difference, you know, our hospital being less expensive, we see every single complication is much lower, much lower use of emergency rooms, much lower use of, of revisions, much lower use of readmissions for, for other reasons. And so I think that that quality piece is, is very tightly related to the cost piece. And how does this differ from kind of, you know, the old school, if you like, something that's not value-based healthcare? Would I be right in thinking you have something wrong with you, you have a procedure done, you're done and out of it. And then if you have a complication with that, that's then a, an additional thing that's separate from the procedure you had before. Is, is that the difference? Well, you know, in the kind of old world and, and still very commonly in the current world, if you go to a hospital and say you go home, then you have a complication, you come back to the hospital, depending on the payment model, chances are the hospital is going to get to charge you more money for that complication, whereas in a value-based type of a, of a payment model, there's a, an amount of money that gets paid that's going to cover that complication. And so there's incentives, you know, for providers to think more holistically about the care that the patient has and to doctor gets called in the evening and maybe it's just easier to send the patient to the emergency room, but maybe they don't really need to go to the emergency room. I mean, the emergency rooms are very expensive. I mean, the reason they're so expensive is because they've, they're staffed up. They've got, you know, specialized equipment, take care of emergencies. But a value-based program, you know, chances are the doctor would say to the patient, well, why don't I see you first thing in the morning in the office if, if the doctor is determined that you know, it's safe? Could you give us any examples, kind of real world examples of how value-based healthcare, in your experience, has improved the experience for a patient? Is it really radically better for patients, for providers? Could, a, a, any examples that come to mind? The CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which pays for Medicare in the United States, has a number of different value-based programs that it's, you know, it's testing out. And we participated in one called CJR, Comprehensive Joint Replacement. And in that program, we basically were incented to have a fixed a price over a 90-day episode. And if during that episode, at the end of the day, if the patient was less expensive than that, that target price, we'd get the money back. But if the patient was more expensive, we'd have to pay CMS the money back. Some of the things that we were able to do in that program was that money we got back, we could put into place different programs that are not typically paid for by a payer. And so one of the programs that we developed was um, something we, we call HSS at Home. And this was before COVID. And at that time, virtual physical therapy 
was not paid. No one would pay for it. And what we were finding when we looked at the cost of care for our patients, that they would go home and they would have someone come into the home, home health and like a home physical therapist. And it seemed pretty expensive. And it also seemed like the patients were getting more than they needed. And our throughplasty surgeons were actually noticing that patients would come back for their six-week follow-up and their knees were you know, kind of red and swollen. Like they were moving around too much. It was too much. Okay. So we put together a panel of orthopedic surgeons, physical therapists, you know, social workers, everybody, and kind of determined, you know, like, could we do physical therapy virtually during that six-week period, right? So I think most people think of physical therapy as kind of a hands-on thing, but a lot of it is observational. You're looking at the patient walk. And I mean, honestly, in the weeks after, you know, a knee or, or hip replacement surgery, you're not moving around that much anyways. You know, the issues are, are, are quite different. Anyways, so we put this into place, and the thing that was so nice about it was that we had continuity of care. Um, not always, but some of the time, you know, the, the patient, when they went home, you know, they would see the therapist who took care of them in the hospital. And if not, we would have the therapist who was going to be doing the, the telecare, you know, meet with them before they left the hospital. And... It is a roaring success. And the, like the specific outcomes that we've been able to measure are, you know, patient satisfaction is very high. It was high also if the, the, the therapist went in the house, but a little bit higher. The outcomes, and we're looking at patient reported outcomes, both in the short term and in the long run. Like, did this have a long term, you know, good or bad effect? So our patient reported outcomes are better. So that means patient's pain and functional status and their quality of life. And complications were lower. So what we observed was with this physical therapist on the video camera with the patient, other things came up. The patient might say to the therapist, I'm having some trouble with my medicines or I'm having a lot of pain or maybe I'm having constipation, very common after surgery. Well, guess what? The therapist was literally sitting next to a nurse practitioner who does post-acute care. So hand the patient over and manage it. And it was a whole lot less expensive. So higher patient satisfaction, better outcomes, and less cost of care. And that that was a very innovative program, right? And and so in that model to use the money in a different, more effective way was much more patient-centered. It's kind of obvious to say, if you're looking after a human being's health, you need to make sure their health is good. It's like, um, which which is what you're talking about. You're looking at not just We'll patch this up and send you on your way. We're going to monitor over time your experience as a patient. So why is that the norm? Why is this a new thing? And also, we've come to the realisation that what we need is value-based healthcare. Why isn't everyone doing it right now? So I think a big challenge, honestly, is the payment models, right? And so, you know, in that example I just gave, there wouldn't have been a way to pay for that. Another thing that that model allowed us to pay for was tracking, right? So there is an administrative cost to track the patient across that entire episode of care to do reporting back. And I think that our health system, I mean, the United States is famously fragmented, but I think the the health system worldwide is somewhat fragmented as well. Because if you think about just the patient getting a hip or knee replacement, you've got different people that are doing their different part, right? So the surgeon is in the operating room and we want that surgeon to do a fabulous job. But then after the patient leaves, you know, it's really not the surgeon's responsibility. They are the captain of that ship, right? And they want the best outcomes, but they're not down in the weeds, right? On how exactly the physical therapy is delivered, you know, for example. And if a patient has, you know, some complication, particularly if it's not a surgical thing, you know, maybe it's the heart or the GI tract, right? And this is an orthopedic surgeon. They've got a look to somebody else. And I think in the kind of current, mostly current world or, you know, old non-value-based world, they might get sent to an emergency room. They might get sent. Whereas if you've got a system in place, you're thinking about all these pieces, right? And I would say too, um, in our program, we put together a whole health optimization program for before the patient has surgery. So we looked at the data, you know, CMS has big data sets that we could look at. 
And we, we said, okay, well, these are the things that patients seem to be getting in trouble for. And our patients, these are the things they get readmitted for. What can we do before the patient even gets admitted to the hospital to tune them up, as it were, right? And that's not the surgeon doing that. So, for example, if a patient uses a certain amount of opioids before they have their surgery. And remember, these are patients that are in hip or knee replacements. They're in a lot of pain. If patients are using a lot of opioids, we know that when they get into the hospital, they're going to require even more and that they're going to have difficulty with their pain management. So we have a program, a specific program for them before they come into the hospital to manage that. If their diabetes isn't under perfect control, we get it under perfect control because there's a higher risk of infections, you know, if blood sugars are not under control, for example. So, so I think it's like taking that holistic approach, but there is a cost to that, right? So there's like an administrative cost to think about the whole program and to manage that whole program. And I think our payment systems are not currently set up to do that. You've got lots of different healthcare professionals involved in a treatment and you're trying to track what's happening throughout that process. And so you're, you're needing data to do that. And I've heard this expression, data uh, interoperability, that's, that's quite important to being able to do what you're doing. Could you explain to us what that is and why it's so important? Yeah, sure. And I would also say this particular program is also an outlier in that CMS made very rich data available to the, the entities we're participating. So in the U.S., we have a multi-payer system. You know, that happens in other countries as well. And we have the health system itself is a bunch of different, you know, hostels. We have over 6,000 hospitals in the United States that are generally not related to each other. There are, are systems as well. So, for example... If a patient comes to our hospital, which is an independent specialty hospital, and then they get readmitted someplace else, we have no idea if that patient got readmitted or why they, if they call the doctor, we'll find out. But, you know, we have found as a result of this CJR program that we were in, that only about half of our readmissions actually come to our hospital, right? And so in that program, CMS on a monthly basis made available to us the claims data for our patients. So we could see exactly what was happening, you know, with them. And that is so critically important to understand your population and how they're doing. About half of our business is commercial and the commercial business is, you know, scattered over a number of different health plans. We don't have access to the claims data for that population named claims data. The other thing too with CMS, when they gave us the data, like we could literally, we said, okay, here's the patient's got readmitted for the same infection. We could go into our, we knew the name of the patient. We could go into our electronic medical record, identify the patient, look and see, okay, what was going on here? Is there something we could have done differently? And that's, you know, really that transparency of data is incredibly helpful for care delivery. And what's been your reflection on how other countries are doing on this? Yeah, it's something that people across the world are looking at. And so as part of this World Economic Forum program that we participate in, I've had the opportunity to speak with colleagues across the world. And I would say, you know, in Europe in particular, there's a great interest in value-based care. And it's, it's kind of interesting that regardless of the specific payment system, and it's, it's very different, different countries in Europe, there's still... a driving interest to get to value-based care. One reason is, is that healthcare is incredibly expensive, right? And, you know, money we're spending on healthcare is money that could be spent on something else. Sure. I think, I think the UK's NHS, certainly the biggest employer in the UK, and therefore you can imagine the budget for it. But when you think about that, you know, the one that's like, okay, but if that's something that we want, you know, it's something valuable to us, then let's pay for it. But we know that there's a lot of waste in the system. So the Institute of Medicine in the U.S. has famously kind of estimated that about a third of healthcare in the U.S. is wasteful. And that, that's a lot of money. And in fact, in the U.S., the comparison that that 30 percent of waste in our system is more than our entire defense budget, is more than our entire education budget. 
Those are shocking your numbers. It's more than our research budget. And so I would say that that waste could be, you know, no matter where you fall on that political spectrum, we could spend that money in a better way. Do you feel it's going in the right direction in, in the US, but also around the world? Do you think, are the policies being put in place in the US and elsewhere in the world? And if not, why not? Yeah, so I think that there's definitely an effort. I think there's a recognition that we need to get to value-based care. And I think that the challenge, at least in the U.S., is there is a enormous fee-for-service infrastructure that was very expensive to build and will be you know, very expensive to change. Um, I think CMS is leading the way in the United States. I see less in value, meaningful value-based care programs from the commercial payers. And I think that it, you know, part of this is the fragmentation in the US healthcare system. So I think that other countries that aren't so fragmented you know, would probably um, have an easier time at this. And the negotiations between hospitals and insurance companies at US are, are largely fee for service. You know, and you got the hospital coming in saying, I want more money. You got the plan coming in saying, I want to reduce the trend or at least keep it stable. And it ends up being reduced to a unit cost discussion. And, you know, we present data to show, yeah, but look at our episode costs and look, our episode cost is lower. I think they believe us, but like the infrastructure, it's, it's administratively expensive for a health plan to do a one off program kind of building the data infrastructure and and we just need to get over it you know and there needs to be an investment i think to get to the value-based care to a greater or lesser extent that applies obviously the us is, is very very different from most countries in europe but also these are big juggernauts to turn around that have been using a certain way of thinking and of funding and of budgeting for for decades and it's and, and it's getting more and more expensive all the time maybe that is the political impetus um the fact we have aging populations in these more developed countries that have big health budgets to actually make the change towards what you're aiming for yourself right you know interestingly i was recently speaking with a colleague who's um, the cfo of a hospital system in the netherlands his perspective on value-based care was very pragmatic he would agree that we ought to be you know uh, promoting patient-centered care etc but when he's looking at the numbers he's looking at an aging population which is going to require more health care and at the same time is going to be leaving the healthcare workforce. So within the healthcare system, we're going to have more people and less people to take care of them. And, you know, his view is just as, as just kind of a, a very practical matter. How are we going to take care of these people? If fewer staff, we have to be higher value, which is like there's no other practical way that we're going to be able to take care of the population. Has there been any kind of ballpark figure of best case scenario, what could be saved, what impact this would have on the cost of healthcare? Well, you know, using the U.S. example, I have to look up the number. I look it up periodically, but I think we're up to maybe four trillion, you know, maybe five, 30 percent of five trillion dollars. That is a huge amount of money, you know, over a trillion dollars. That's just in the U.S. In your collaboration with the World Economic Forum, you've met people in similar situations, other parts of the world. What about the less developed countries? Um, places that are building health services that aren't yet at the level or the expenditure of of Europe or the US or, or other developed countries. Have you have you have you had experience with with some of those countries? And, and where does this whole conversation fit into that? Yeah, I mean that's the thing that's been so amazing to me with this World Economic Forum initiative is how the same principles really apply. And I guess I, I would say a word of advice to countries whose health systems are less developed, and I say that in quotation marks, because what I see is other countries in some ways trying to mirror some of the things that we've done, ways to track expenditures that we do in the U.S. in our fee-for-service system, you know, which the whole infrastructure is problematic in getting to value-based care. So I think, oh, 
don't go that route. That's, you know, think about this differently. Dr. Catherine McLean is the Chief Value Medical Officer at the Hospital for Special Surgery. Before her, you heard Meni Stiliadu, founder and co-lead of the Health Outcomes Observatory. To find out more, search for the Global Coalition for Value in Healthcare on the World Economic Forum website. We've done several episodes about innovation in healthcare on Radio Davos. Have a look through our archives on weft.ch slash podcast, where you'll also find our weekly sister podcast, Meet the Leader. You can also get all those podcasts on Spotify, Apple, or any other podcast app. And join the conversation on the World Economic Forum Podcast Club on Facebook. This episode of Radio Davos was written and presented by me, Robin Pomeroy, with editing by Jerry Johansson and studio production by Gareth Nolan. We'll be back next week, but for now, thanks to you for listening and goodbye.